The learning objective of this chapter is for the student to become familiar with the six degrees of motion experienced by a ship in a seaway, accelerations produced by ship's motions in a seaway, the effects of beam seas and following seas, wind forces to which container ships are generally susceptible, and classification society applications. A watchkeeping officer on board a fully loaded, very large crude carrier, or VLCC, experiencing heavy weather conditions associated with Beaufort 47, for example, may not enter heavy weather in the logbook. But the watchkeeping officer on board a coastal tanker operating in the same area as the VLCC might regard the weather condition differently and might log it as heavy weather. Although both ships are experiencing heavy weather conditions, the term heavy weather is not entered in both logbooks and therefore appears to be relative. Whereas the fully laden tanker might have been rock steady in these weather conditions due to its deeper draft, the wind, seas and swell, on the other hand, may have tossed the coastal tanker about. In high latitudes, it often happens that the formation of ice on deck is logged as heavy weather. The term is used here only because of prevailing sub-zero temperatures, not because of severe weather conditions. Apart from the relative usage of the term heavy weather, however, each ship at sea is subjected to six degrees of motion due to external forces. As we have already seen, these forces produce accelerations, an indication of which should be found in the CSM for various cargo storage positions on board a ship. The extent to which a particular container is subjected to these forces depends upon its storage position on board. Acceleration is defined as the rate of change of velocity. To change the velocity, a force is required. Therefore, if there is acceleration, there must also be a net force that acts to change the velocity. If you were seated in an aircraft prior to takeoff, there would be no velocity, no acceleration, and therefore no net force. As the aircraft traveled down the runway, you would experience an increasing crushing force as it accelerated for takeoff. This force would tend to push you back into your seat. At this stage, the aircraft is accelerating or changing its velocity under its own propulsion. A ship at sea can also accelerate or decelerate whilst under its own propulsion under the influence of stern seas or when it meets head seas. More importantly though are the accelerations caused by external forces such as the wind, sea and swell. The crushing force you experienced in the aircraft as it moved forward is similar to the crushing force experienced by containers on a ship as it is pushed forward by heavy following seas. When that happens, the container lashing system that consists of lashing rods, twist locks, turnbuckles, D-rings, pad eyes, etc., undergoes stresses in one form or another. You would experience an ever-increasing force as the aircraft left the runway, changing its direction to become airborne whilst climbing at a fairly steep angle. The steeper the angle of ascent, the greater would be the force you experienced. When a ship encounters head-on seas and starts climbing up the approaching face of a wave, the containers experience increasing forces, with the lashing rods also subjected to tensile and compression forces. The steeper the wave face, the greater the forces acting on the container stacks and their associated lashing components. The lashing rods could buckle, or, if already buckled, could fail. Once the aircraft was level and flying at a constant speed, you would not feel the crushing force, since no accelerations would have been produced during this time. However, if the aircraft suddenly dropped, you would feel as though your stomach was being lifted up. The containers on a ship that constantly rises and falls due to heaving would be lifted up and dropped in synchronism, thereby imparting compression and tensile forces to their lashing components. The effects of heaving, though, do not generally result in twist locks shearing during heavy weather. After the aircraft landed, you would have experienced a force pushing you forward against your seatbelt as the aircraft decelerated, or slowed down, on the runway. Similarly, when a ship starts moving down into a trough between two waves, the lashing rods experience forces in opposition to those experienced when the ship moved up a wave face.
As a ship pitches, the lashing rods tend to be alternately stretched and compressed. Containers stowed under deck would bear up alternately against the forward and after cell guides where fitted. During your flight, you therefore experienced A. Forces in a particular direction due to accelerations while taking off. B. Random heaving forces when in flight through turbulence. And C. Forces acting in the opposite direction due to decelerations upon landing. The aircraft's motions during takeoff and landing produced the accelerations that caused the forces you experienced. If you now substitute the passengers for containers, and the aircraft for a ship, it would not be difficult to imagine what would happen if the containers were not properly secured. On a ship moving at a constant speed through the sea, every container will be carried in the same line of motion as the ship and at the ship speed. Since the ship speed is constant, and provided there are no external forces acting on the ship, no forces will be imparted to the containers and their associated lashing components. If the ship were to turn to port or starboard, there would be an automatic speed reduction, producing decelerations that, in turn, would produce certain forces. Whether a ship turns of its own accord, such as by rudder movements, or under the influence of heavy seas, such as when yawing, the forces produced will be transmitted to the containers, with corresponding tensile and or compression forces transmitted to the associated lashing components. The integrity of a container lashing system depends upon the strength of the weakest lashing component in that system. Due to age, improper use of components, and or poor maintenance schedules, twist locks may fail, lashing rods may buckle, and turnbuckles, pad eyes, D-rings, or dovetail foundations may crack. Even in slight sea conditions, we often hear creaking sounds as the container stacks tend to play against their lashing components reminding us that certain forces and corresponding accelerations are constantly being produced. There are three rotational degrees of motion to which ships are subjected at sea under the influence of external forces. These are rolling, pitching and yawing. These are termed rotational motions because every ship partly rotates around its fore and aft longitudinal axis when rolling, around its athwartships or transverse axis when pitching, and around its vertical axis when yawing. There are also three linear degrees of motion to which ships are subjected at sea under the influence of external forces. These are surging, swaying and heaving and are called linear because every ship surges back and forth along its fore and aft longitudinal axis, sways to port and starboard along its athwart ships or transverse axis, and heaves up and down along its vertical axis. The six degrees of motion combine in different ways to produce the following accelerations. One, transverse accelerations that act across a ship's deck in the athwart ship's direction. Two, longitudinal accelerations that act along a ship's deck in the fore and aft direction, and three, vertical accelerations that act up and down perpendicular to a ship's deck. When a classification society evaluates the strength of a container lashing system for a particular ship, the forces taken into account in developing the content of the supporting CSM are typically resolved into vertical and transverse components. The vertical forces are considered as those forces that act normal to the deck, whilst the transverse forces are considered as those acting across it. Ships generally tend to pitch at the frequency of the wave encounter period, a factor that is not inherent in a ship. It is therefore more difficult for classification societies to assess loads produced by pitching. A head sea condition with extreme pitching is assumed when evaluating loads into the deck and hatch covers or hatch pontoons. With respect to rolling, the task becomes easier because ships tend to roll close to their natural roll periods, a factor that is inherent in a ship. A resonant rolling condition 
under the influence of beam seas, is frequently applied for assessing transverse loads into a container lashing system. The acceleration values taken into account by classification societies are as anticipated or estimated for a particular ship before the ship enters seagoing service. Transverse and vertical accelerations are estimated from the shape of the surface or subsurface of a ship, its extreme breadth, the relative positions of the centers of gravity and buoyancy, length of the parallel body, and other parameters that determine the behavior of the ship at sea, as recorded for model testing. As this information is estimated and recorded in the CSM prior to a ship entering service, it is somewhat unreliable. The actual behavior of a particular ship at sea is not fully known during the ship's design stage. Acceleration values can only be anticipated. The absolute accelerations that a ship experiences will somewhat differ from the estimated values in the CSM. However, the absolute values are not excessively high or vastly different from those recorded. It is important that tables or diagrams in CSMs, together with worked examples on accelerations, are fully understood. Of the six degrees of motion, rolling, pitching and heaving are the most common and generate the largest accelerations. As the ends of each imaginary axis experience the maximum motions, it will be appreciated that the most severe forces on a container ship can be expected in the following positions. One, when pitching, at the extreme forward and the last two container bays. Two, when rolling, at the extreme port and starboard container rows. And three, when heaving, in the highest container tier on deck and the lowest container tier under deck. Alternate rolling and pitching increase and reduce container stack pressures. The pressure changes reaching maximum values when each motion is reversed. The stack pressures are superimposed when rolling and pitching occur simultaneously and will probably lead to failure, such as when a large container ship experiences parametric rolling. This rolling occurs when a large container vessel pitches to head or following seas to such an extent that her transverse stability is affected by alternately being on wave crests and wave troughs. Pitching and rolling generate acceleration. Imagine a container in a stowage position that is equidistant from the pitch or roll axis of your ship. If the ship started experiencing heavy weather, it would start pitching and or rolling. As these motions became more violent, the time period for each pitch and or roll period would be reduced. If the pitch or roll period was reduced by half, the acceleration forces acting on a container would be quadrupled or increased four times as the ship moved more violently from side to side or end to end. If, on the other hand, the pitch or roll period was doubled, the acceleration forces acting on the container would be quartered. Increasing the roll period so as to reduce the effects of acceleration on containers would, however, affect the ship's stability. We shall see later in this module how variations in stability can lead to parametric rolling. During pitching, a ship is alternately lifted in and out of the sea at the bow and stern. The pitch angle varies with the length of a ship. In relatively short ships, pitch angles range between 5 and 8 degrees, sometimes more, while in longer ships they are usually less than 5 degrees. On a container ship of 300 meters in length, with a pitching angle of, say, 3 degrees, a container stowed in the bay closest to the bow or stern at a distance of approximately 140 meters from the pitching axis, will cover a rotational distance of about 29 meters during one full pitch cycle. The container will be raised by 7.33 meters upwards from the horizontal before descending 14.66 meters downwards, finally being raised 7.33 meters again before repeating the process. During pitching, container stack pressures forward and aft will alternately rise and fall. Due to the larger pitch angles, these stack pressures will be higher on relatively longer ships than on shorter ones.
Besides affecting the base twist locks or doubler plates in the cargo holds of non-cellular vessels, the rising pressures tend to crush and deform the corner posts of the containers themselves. Surveyors often allege that rolling, in combination with shipping green seas on deck, results in container losses. It is not to be inferred that green seas carry away containers or wash them overboard, but that the seas gaining access to the deck means that the ship, especially a cellular container ship, roll to fairly large angles. The stormy winter months of the North Atlantic Ocean contribute to the greatest number of containerized cargo losses. In a stiff ship with associated small writing levers, rolling periods of 10 seconds or less are to be expected. In moderate seas, even large container ships will easily roll to 10 degrees. At a roll period of 10 seconds, during which large accelerations are generated, a ship swings from side to side 8,640 times over a 24-hour period. Over several days of bad weather, the container lashing systems would thus be exposed to alternating loads as the stack pressures alternately rise and fall. In heavy weather, however, roll angles of 30 degrees are not unusual, even for very large container ships. Fin stabilizers and other anti-healing systems may help to dampen rolling, but their effects are limited to small angles of roll. On rare occasions, roll angles may reach 45 degrees and above, which are typically outside allowable classification society limits. It is easy to imagine what that would mean for inadequately secured containers or the use of old and worn lashing components. Although ship securing arrangements are designed to resist the effects of rolling, we must remember that each system is designed to perform its function within specified limits only. Lashing equipment manufacturers design their equipment based upon the forces that have been calculated by classification societies. For example, for maximum roll amplitudes of anywhere between 22 and 30 degrees. Although each design carries its own safety factor, allowing for exposure to forces beyond 30 degree angles of heel, the effectiveness of such allowances cannot be measured. The maximum roll condition for a particular ship generally governs the design of the container securing system for that ship. During heavy weather, larger roll angles will result in the forces acting on the container securing system to fall outside the design parameters, resulting in failure of lashing components and consequential loss of containers. If container losses are to be reduced, it is important for ship's officers to know the limitations of the lashing system on board their ship. Passage planning through a particular area or during a particular season does not, however, allow for the design criteria of lashing components to be taken into account, especially in the liner conference trades. It often happens that whereas the containers themselves have not shifted from their original stowage positions on board during heavy weather periods, their cargoes may have shifted and may have damaged a container's side walls. This happens because the parties responsible for securing the cargoes inside a particular container fail to appreciate that the carrier could be exposed to the effects of heavy weather at sea. Heaving is the up and down movement of a ship and could cause a container to experience a force approaching 1G, which is 100% the weight of the container plus its cargo. Heaving also affects a ship's buoyancy due to the instantaneous and rapid changes of water plane areas as the ship moves vertically up and down in a seaway. Steep seas and swell associated with heavy weather result in very rapid changes of buoyancy compared to when the ship is experiencing moderate sea conditions. When a ship is forced upwards, it eventually comes to rest on the crest of a wave, and when it moves down, it eventually comes to rest in the trough of a wave. As we have seen during this cycle, the water plane areas change rapidly and affect the ship's buoyancy. Generally, depending upon a ship's design parameters, a ship will sink lower into the trough of a wave as its buoyancy falls, and will rise higher towards the crest of a wave as its buoyancy increases. Vertical acceleration forces, produced mostly during heaving, act along container corner posts, twist locks, and those areas of a ship's hatch pontoons and tank top plating with which the lowest tiers of containers are in contact.
Where the forces exceed the strength of the underlying hatch pontoon or tank top plating, the containers pierce the underlying plating. This is more common on reinforced areas of double bottom tank top plating. Longitudinal accelerations are mainly caused by pitching and, to a lesser extent, surging and yawing. The maximum longitudinal accelerations are usually imparted to the container lashing system when a ship is at an extreme pitch angle or when slamming in heavy head seas. Heavy slamming can also cause containers to fall forward and can damage the thrust pads of underlying pontoons. Base twist locks placed on hatch pontoons or hatch covers, pedestals and or deck extensions also incur longitudinal forces caused by the torsional deformation or angle of twist of a ship's hull. As we have said before, vertical accelerations are mainly caused by heaving, but also, to a lesser extent, by pitching and rolling. Any container that is subjected to movement in the vertical plane will experience vertical accelerations. The maximum vertical accelerations acting on a container stowed forward or aft are usually developed when a ship is at its extreme pitch angle. For outboard containers, when a ship is at the extreme angle of roll, and in general, when a ship is on the crest or trough of a wave. If the extreme pitch angle occurs simultaneously with heaving, as often happens during heavy weather, failure of turnbuckles and or twist locks is likely to occur. Transverse accelerations are the most important factor when deciding the lashing system for a particular sea route and during a particular season. The accelerations are caused mainly by rolling and, to a lesser extent, by a combination of yawing and swaying. Roll angles are related to the extent of transverse accelerations produced. If these values fall outside the ship's design parameters for a particular sea route in which heavy weather may be expected, it is highly likely that containers will fall overboard from high stowage positions. In principle, transverse accelerations for cargo can be calculated from the formula shown here. From the formula, it will be observed that A. Transverse accelerations are inversely proportional to the ship's breadth. If the ship's breadth is increased, the transverse accelerations will decrease in proportion. B. Transverse accelerations are directly proportional to the distance from the baseline Z. Therefore, the lowest containers tiers on deck, for example, will be less affected by transverse accelerations than those in the uppermost tier. C. Transverse accelerations are directly proportional to the metacentric height, or GM. Therefore, a decrease in GM will also decrease the overall effect of transverse accelerations as the ship becomes more tender and rolls less violently to a greater time period. D. The roll period, TR, is inversely proportional to the square root of the GM. As the GM is affected by cargo distribution, it is again obvious that correctly loading a ship is of utmost importance in minimizing the transverse accelerations. Although one cannot do anything in respect of the ship's breadth or changing the distance of containers from the baseline, one could ensure that the containers in the lowest tiers are not overstowed by heavier ones and ensure that the load plans are accurate. There is also not much one can do to reduce the GM either, as in doing so, other factors such as torsional stresses might go into the red on the ship's loading computer. Where large ballast tanks are fitted on small container ships, there remain large free surface effects due to residual ballast remaining on board. Only a few tons of ballast will make a difference to computerized GM values. Accurate load plans are therefore necessary. Because a fully laden container ship presents a high profile above the waterline, winds blowing across open seas produce forces on their own on the container stacks. During heavy weather, the exposed container stacks experience wind forces, the degree of which depends upon the velocity and direction of the wind and the profile of individual container stacks. The higher the stacks, the greater the surface area of exposure, and consequently the greater the wind force leading to fully laden ships healing during strong gusts of wind. Healing moments are shown in tabular or illustrated form in the CSM and stability booklet, 
and can also be obtained from the loading computer. When a ship experiences heavy weather with associated high wind speeds, the transverse forces acting upon a single 40-foot container could be as much as 3.6 tons. The transverse force imparted to a five-steer tack of containers could therefore be 18 tons. The formulae provided by classification societies for estimating wind forces are determined from numerical simulation or model testing. One particular classification society gives the values shown here for standard ISO container side and end walls. These values were taken into the design load calculations by the classification society concerned. For any given stowage plane, a cargo securing program will first calculate the applicable forces and will then compare the data with the minimum safe working criteria specified by the classification society concerned. The effect of wind forces on the outboard stacks or on stacks elsewhere that are higher than the surrounding stacks and are therefore exposed to the wind is also taken into account. These programs warn the user when any of the securing components or individual container frames are likely to be overloaded. The loading computer displays the results of applying additional lashings. The greatest risk of losing containers overboard, apart from when a container ship experiences parametric rolling in heavy weather, occurs in beam sea conditions with the onset of resonant rolling. When this happens, the ship starts to progressively roll to larger angles with each successive roll, increasing the roll period and associated forces imparted to the container lashing systems. It is important for an officer of the watch to realize that his ship is approaching a resonant rolling condition, so that he can take appropriate steps to rectify the situation. At night, it is more difficult to realize that resonant rolling is developing, as the duty officer does not have the benefit of actually observing beam seas during the hours of darkness. Setting limits on the bridge clinometer could make the duty officer aware of the impending situation, as he may not know that the design roll limits for his ship are being approached. It is good practice for the master to state the clinometer limits in the night order book, so that he will be summoned to the bridge if the ship starts to approach those limits. When containers are damaged or lost overboard in heavy weather, investigations will almost certainly follow at the next port of call, where the attending surveyors will ask to interview the watchkeeping officers and will record details from the night order book. In taking steps to correct resonant rolling from beam seas, caution must be exercised with the ship's heading. Large container ships are prone to parametric rolling when heading into near head seas. Large roll angles often occur from following seas, especially on container ships fitted with wide, flat sterns. Whilst following seas may assist the ship's speed, longitudinal and vertical accelerations will be generated. This situation is more difficult to get out of, as larger course alterations are required than if the ship was experiencing beam seas. Attempting large alterations, of course, might also result in the ship rolling, and although small angles of roll may initially be experienced, larger amplitudes might quickly be generated. It should be noted that the International Maritime Organization has published guidelines for shipmasters to avoid getting into a dangerous situation in following and quartering seas.